Thanks for joining us today. Um, I've got Todd Thomas of Asphalt Materials Incorporated and Jerry Geib of MinDOT here to talk about the research and evaluation of void reducing asphalt membranes or VRAMs. So I will turn it over to Todd who's going to start us off and. Very good. And I'm switching over to my presentation. Let me know if you're not able to see that this it's still opening. All right. All right, is that showing up? Yes, I see that. All right, so, uh, so I'll do some introductions and talk about some of the basic issues that uh, we're dealing with in longitudinal joints and talk about the solution or a material solution to that being avoid reducing asphalt membrane, how that works. <clears throat> I'll also talk about some of the first uh, VRAM projects and some of IDOT's research results. Um, and then also then, as you can see with Jerry on the call, he's going to go through their efforts and their research with Iowa State. And, and I am talking about some of this work just because we were involved in some of the early work with Illinois DOT and we had uh, co-authored with them on a TRB paper published earlier this year. So it's probably not too difficult for people in this group who have seen pavements that look like this, where you see there, say in the left-hand picture, a pavement that's in relatively good condition, but if you look at the joint, it, it's starting to deteriorate. Picture on the right shows the pavement in a little worse condition and that joint also in, in worse condition as well. And that's gonna be the place where you're gonna see some of the first deterioration or the first part of the pavement to fail or call it the Achilles heel um, of every road. So when you get some failure here, some deterioration, then you're, you're doing the maintenance and um, you're getting the workers out there to do that work. Um, this edge as it's being paved is the most difficult part of the pavement to obtain density and therefore it's more permeable and uh, you can get water and air that gets into that. And it's expensive to repair. Um, there's also uh, other markings, paint markings, reflective pavement markings that are in that area as well. If you have rumble strips, that can be uh, uh, problematic too uh, to try to get those repaired. So when that joint fails, the, the rest of the road also is going to eventually follow and then have more maintenance. So let me go through how VRAM works and uh, talk about some of the early work first. So in the early 2000s, Illinois DOT saw the need for a better performance at the joint and noticed that these joints are failing because of permeability, as mentioned, that, that water is getting into that joint area and causing an early failure. So their concept was to fill a portion of those voids with a void reducing asphalt membrane. And there's some terminology I'm going to explain here in a minute, uh, but uh, they had seen the need to come up with a material solution because they were having um, uh, problems coming up with a more mechanical solution. So talk about terminology for just a second. So VRAM, as I call it, is a, a void reducing asphalt membrane as mentioned. Illinois calls this longitudinal joint sealant or LJS. So you're gonna see those names used interchangeably. Um, I'm not trying to make this a promotional presentation either, but um, a lot of people have heard the name J-Band and, and that is just our trade name for an LJS product or a VRAM product. Um, so what that is, is the VRAM, you can get lower air voids by filling those voids with asphalt from the bottom up. That VRAM material is a highly polymer modified material that uh, has uh, the elastomeric polymers in it. So the main component is asphalt and I often get asked is, is the rubber in this and there's not. That's why I point that out. There's no rubber in the product. 
And uh, it's going to fill those voids approximately 50 to 70 percent of the overlay thickness that's being placed on top of it. So now I have an animation that um, will give you a little bit more of an idea of how this works. So hopefully that showed how the product works, at least from an an animation standpoint. Sorry about this, let me move on. And so to talk about the effect of a VRAM at, at the joint, <clears throat> given an example here of a hot mix that has five and a half percent asphalt, and if it's laid at an inch and a half thick, it'll have nine pounds of liquid asphalt in a square yard. With the VRAM product, that's typically placed at a 1.47 pound per foot. It, it's going down at, in a per foot equation and 18 inches wide. That liquid asphalt from the VRAM is going to be 8.8%. So the total asphalt content in that joint area is going to be 10.3%. And if you do the calculations and look at 10 to 13% air voids at the joint, the VRAM would occupy two thirds of the overlay height. So it gives you an idea a little bit on some of the basics on those calculations. And to talk about some of the features, um, it is going, again, mentioned a few times, fill that, that overlay thickness to 50% or more of that height um, for at least an inch and a half application. It also bonds very well to the underlying pavement and uh, gives crack resistance at the joint. And then in terms of it, its application, you saw the, uh, the mention in the video of the uh, material distributor that does have mechanical agitation in that. And obviously it's able to um, hold heat. Um, it is a hot product, it's not an emulsion product. So that product in that tank is somewhere between 300 and 320 Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's got a special spray bar for it, or there is a manual strike off box that's been used, that's coming from a heating kettle. There you see in the middle picture. And then there's also a toe behind melder application that you can see in the right picture. And that one would be just a trailer mounted pulled by a pickup truck. So it's typically applied 18 inches wide um, or nine inches when the mill and fill is done. And that 18 inches uh, or nine inches on either side of that joint was it came up from the um, studies that showed that 
when you get n about nine inches away from the edge of pavement on compaction, you start getting density equal to the rest of the mat. It's also non-tracking in less than 30 minutes or probably more like five or 10 minutes. Um, and it's based on cooling time. It, it hits a certain temperature and you can see traffic able to cross it and you can see the tire tracks on that uh, picture. And then the first paving pass is going to cover half of the VRAM width. So right hand picture shows. I'll talk about some of the performance in the state of Illinois. And back in 2002 and 2003, they did nine experimental test sections. And then in 2017, after those pavements had had a lot of time of service, uh, they went out and took cores from three of those. So one in District 7, one District 1, and the other one in District 2. And I'll talk about some of the results of those studies, some of the pictures too. So US 51 in District 7, um, this shows some of those performance pictures at, in 2017. So the left-hand picture is showing what, again, they call it LJS. Uh, you can see that transition from the LJS to the control. So in the bottom part of the left-hand picture, the LJS is in pretty good shape. And the top of the picture, you'll see a lot of uh, patches that have been placed in that center line joint. And at one time during the maintenance of this pavement, they had applied the crack filler in the control section and they kept going through the LJS section. That's why you see that there, though that's uh, not typically done. In the right hand picture, you see uh, similar with the uh, top part of that picture being LJS and the bottom being the control section. Um, this one in uh, Rickton Park on Illinois 50, the LJS test section is in the uh, left-hand picture. And here you can see just a, a slight joint opening, uh, but, but there's no crack filler that's in there. And that joint area is performing as good as the rest of the pavement. The right-hand picture does show the control section where there's been a um, fair amount of maintenance done at the joint, not, not nearly as bad as the previous slide. And then on Illinois 26, uh, again, 14 years later, the left-hand picture shows LJS. You can see again, some joint opening on the left-hand picture of the LJS section. The middle picture shows that transition from the control to the LJS. So you can see where those cracks start developing in the control. And the right-hand picture does show the control section. So joint opening and some of that crack formation and you can see too that there's been no maintenance uh, performed on that uh, project. So in terms of those cores that they took on those three sections, and I here I'm showing um, two cores, um, one being a control core in the left-hand picture, the right one having the VRAM product in it. So these were not taken from the research section, but I thought this was a good picture to show a side-by-side -side comparison of what a core would typically look like. And so in their testing, they did asphalt content, migration, permeability, and I-fit uh, flexibility test. And um, kind of go through to that testing in a little bit more detail. Um, they did a migration by digital imaging and Brian Hill at IDOT had shown us how to do that type of testing and shared a lot of knowledge from that. So the, the picture on the left is really our setup. Uh, but they did a similar setup in their labs too. And you'll see in the right hand picture with the graph, essentially what this digital imaging is doing is plotting lift height and pixel intensity. Pixel intensity is related to asphalt content or it's you know how dark it is from the bottom of the core to the top. And you'll see in, in determining the migration height of LJS, you would uh, look at the red curve in the right hand picture and the place where that red curve starts going vertical, that would be the height that the migration has occurred to, and then that's just divided by the overlay thickness. Control section, at least theoretically, ought to have a vertical line so that the asphalt content or the pixel intensity is the same from the bottom to the top. So again, the red line being more on the right at the bottom part of that core or curve it's just relating to the higher asphalt content in that part of the core. 
They also did permeability testing. Again, this isn't their picture, but this is just the vertical flow. And, and just to illustrate the point that those cores were placed in the permeameter and it has a rubber bladder to, to seal off any outflow from the sides of the specimen. And then their IFIT flexibility index, and, and I'm imagining a lot of people in this audience are familiar with that, uh, but essentially what that is, is the uh, fracture energy or the area under that curve of a load versus displacement curve, and that's divided by the post-peak slope uh, from the testing. So going back to, um, let's go more of a summary here on that core testing. Um, so the asphalt content was nearly doubled for the VRAM cores, and the example I showed showed that. They also saw that the migration was 26 to 66 percent of the layer height, and this picture on the right from Illinois 26 shows what those numbers look like. And I'll point out too, I'd mentioned that 50 percent would be a target migration level. Um, when they got under that, they were at that time testing various formulations, but they also saw that these lower migrations still had good performance in the field. Uh, from the permeability testing, what they ended up doing was testing the top half and the bottom half of those, those cores and found that essentially the top half of either the LJS or the control cores all had nearly equal lab permeability but if you keep in mind that that LJS or VRAM material is more in the bottom part of that core, that's also what showed the difference here. So the bottom half showed that the control was at 110 to 372, uh, 10 to the negative fifth centimeter per second on the permeability and the VRAM had zero. They, there was no um, water that passed through those. And then from their flexibility index values, on those cores, the controls were 0.2 to 0.8. The VRAM was 1.9 to 23. So VRAM being much higher than the controls. And also they say that the long-term aged lab specimens ought to have an F5 value of 4.0. So you can see here that those controls were far below that. And so that work had resulted in a TRB paper that was uh, presented early this year and uh, main authors being Jim Trepanier and John Sanger from Illinois DOT and then co-authors from Asphalt Materials and that would be me and Marvin Xline. And just want to go through what some of these results are uh, from that paper. And so basically uh, what they saw was that, that the return on investment was three to five times the cost of the VRAM. And so they also saw too that the VRAM provided a life extension of three to five years. <clears throat> and I'll explain the, the curve here, uh, the graph here. So they're giving uh, the pavements the life of 15 years, and this is starting on year 16. So that one additional year would be year 16. And so their calculations showed that they see would see payoff if they got one additional year, if the unit cost per linear foot was six dollars and 46 cents per foot so the actual cost in 2020 was 239 uh, a foot so they're definitely getting um, a major payoff there and again they based on the the cost of the product per mile they'll see that the benefit is three to five times the cost of the material so to summarize this presentation, the longitudinal construction joints are the first part of the pavement to fail. A material solution, VRAM, does fill a portion of the voids to make the void area impermeable and to increase the flexibility. And then it also provides a life extension of that joint area of three to five years. And the benefit is shown to be three to five times the initial cost of the material. And there is a website that we have, thejointsolution.com, that has um, some of the resources there that has uh, some calculators uh, as well. So um, feel free to take a look at that. And I thank you for your time. Jerry, I'll turn it over to you. OK, thanks, Todd. Let me set up my screen here.
Can everyone see my slideshow? And I should be going to uh, should be in presentation mode. Looks great, Jerry. OK, thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Todd. And, and I really like some of the pictures you had because I think because of seeing some of those pictures a few years ago or similar ones is really why MnDOT started our first void reducing asphalt membrane project. So I've really got two main areas to talk to uh, today. First, the Iowa State University, which did our VRAM research, and then the MnDOT special provision, which has been developed but has not been posted yet. So the Iowa State University project, it was called the use of J-band to improve the longitudinal performance of the HMA longitudinal joint. <clears throat> the actual research started, I think about 2018, but uh, was completed. Final report was posted December of 2020. If you're in the MnDOT Research Services section and where all our published reports are available, it's report number 2020-33. There's also a, a two page technical summary there that goes along with it. Chris Williams, Professor Chris Williams was the principal investigator for the project. Co-PI was Joe Podolsky, and actually Joe started working for MnDOT in our MinRoad section about one week ago. So uh, welcome to Joe. Joe, and now we have a uh, and our, our expert re researcher in the MnDOT family here. So our, our research was done on a couple of projects. We were working with District 7. They also got a little additional funding, I think even from uh, our maintenance operations research group. And they put some VRAM down on two different sections in 2018 on uh, Minnesota Highway 22, a little south of Mankato and on uh, US Highway 169. So we had VRAM sections, control sections without the VRAM. Uh, I think we even had a little longitudinal joint together with the VRAM on 169, but that was not part of our study. So we did a lot of coring and testing, uh, I believe the following summer after the project was completed. And the test of the asphalt core, cores with the, and we're using J-band in here in the presentation because that was the project uh, that was the product name that we use, but the VRAM, the void reducing asphalt membrane, is our specification or our special provision is written. So it showed that the VRAM material migrated up into the top layer, all these things uh, that I talked about. And all of, really all of the testing that was done in the research project. Uh, so the VRAM cores, they had higher bond strength, much lower permeability, uh, air voids were filled and improved crack resistance. So I'm, I'm gonna say they're all better, kind of exactly quantifying that better by percent or something's a little more difficult. Uh, that really comes in the performance in the field. Todd had some pretty good pictures on that, but everything that was done in the research showed that a VRAM product made the joint better. So my kind of thoughts on uh, the VRAM, how to keep the best longitudinal joint and things that echelon paving probably, it, it has produced great joints, longitudinal joints for us. It's probably very expensive. If uh, I, in here I have an initial cost of $3 a linear foot. Uh, that's about what it was on our research project where we only had the quantity to, to do one mile. But Todd showed you that uh, in Illinois, I think it was where they're doing a lot of it, probably a 240, maybe a 250 dollars per linear foot, which covers both lanes. So then you're really, you know, half a 250 or a buck quarter per lane mile uh, to get a much better joint. So that's uh, really a great value. So I'm kind of thinking I, I would use the a VRAM project on the center line of any 
two way Minnesota highway. I'd especially use it if that center line is going to have a, a rumble strip ground into it, uh, grinding through, you know, if our top lifts an inch and a half and you're going to grind that rumble strip down, I think eh, I should probably, uh, maybe a little less than a half inch, but uh, you're, you're certainly grinding into the weakest part of the pavement from, you know, density standpoint there. We should probably be using on the on the center line of our uh, divided highways. Uh, cost probably coming in around 250 a foot if after we really get our program going and start using a lot. Uh, and I'd still use the, the the joint adhesive that just gets placed along the face of like the longitudinal lane line shoulder joint is probably uh, still what I would recommend. And I think last year uh, I was looking at some of our bid tab annual summary and we used over a million feet a longitudinal joint adhesive so we are doing a lot of work to keep our longitudinal joints in better shape now i'm going to talk about the mindot special provision although not posted our final edit version is downtown in our central office with the special provision specification unit and they're doing their final review. But we do have uh, uh, the longitudinal or the special provision number. It's a 2331 number right now. Void reducing asphalt membrane is the name. And some of the information in these next few slides are, are come right out of the uh, actual special provision that's written. So VRAM's applied underneath the longitudinal construction joint Todd's uh, demonstration or video showed how that goes down and you put it down right before placing the final lift. Uh, the picture I, I do have here probably won't be in the final special provision. Uh, we had it in an earlier version and we've kind of described that instead of using pictures in the final special provision. But you can see uh, 18 inches wide, covers about nine inches of each lane. Uh, so to, to have the special provision and not the proprietary specification, we've got uh, physical tests that are run on the material. It, it can be made by different producers that make different products, but they do need to meet these special uh, these specifications. Uh, and, and that's part of the certification of uh, what the contractor will provide to MINDOT uh, that the material they purchased meets uh, the criteria here in the tables. Some a little based on even some of the super paved grading systems, Steve sti st the creep stiffness minus 18C, and we've got the similar super pave type values there. Uh, equipment, Todd showed you three different pictures of how you can put it down. So the distributor uh, for a nice rural paving project where you, you, you want to put it down for the day paving, use a nice distributor. Uh, so apply the material at the specified application rate and width, provided in a single pass. There's also a picture of the uh, melter kettle uh, maybe in some of the metro projects where you're paving shorter sections and in a little tighter closed quarters that that melter kettle would be a pretty uh, good way to apply the material uh, yep so and the two the two different ways the pressure fed wand or an application shoe with the spray bar type thing and there's some criteria here for recirculating and agitation. So uh, key points, you know, apply it when it's clean and dry. You, you need to know where that center line uh, location is. We'd like you to be within two inches of that. Uh, Todd mentioned application temperature, which is a little lower than this. I think 310 to 320. We do not want you to exceed 330. I'm not sure about these polymers, but I know with the super paved binders, if you get it, get the binders too hot, you start to break down kind of the polymer network. 
Yeah, and you're going to lose the advantages of having that polymer in there. Uh, our special provision does say, you know, apply prior to tack. That's ideal. You know, you can apply it over the fully cured tack if that's just the way the operations are going that day. Non tracking in 30 minutes. Todd mentioned on a you know nice Minnesota summer day, it might be uh, five to 10 minutes that it is non tracking. We do have a, a application table rate, so depending on the thicknesses and whether your material, the hot mix is more on the coarse or fine side, there's different uh, rates that are I think are measured in pounds per foot there. Uh, and it can also be used with an SMA and uh, the super paid five mixes. I think one advantage of using this material is then we're going to eliminate the longitudinal joint joint density coring operation that definitely uh, saves the contractor some money there that they're not out there taking a couple cores in our new longitudinal joint. Although then it, it does also kind of negatively impact the, the incentive for getting good density. Uh, so maybe we'll need to look at that in the future, but you do not have to do any coring on your longitudinal joint if you use the VRAM product. Quality control, quality assurance at this point is fairly simple. Uh, quality control from the contractor standpoint is providing the cer certification from the manufacturer that the material met all of the specifications. That's very similar to uh, hot mix asphalt binder in, in the combined state binder group we use that the material is certified by the manufacturer to meet specification and then the quality assurance, the MnDOT side uh, or the owner agency side uh, of sampling it during the field. We typically sample during the first or we will sample during the first 20 minutes of application and then take a sample for every 25,000 gallons applied. That's kind of the, I think our thought process there was the same way we uh, look at joint sealant. Uh, when we do crack filling and things, we always start or take the first test early at the beginning application. Make sure that even uh, the first material that goes down is within specification. It wasn't, you know, heated or reheated too many times before it got to our project. So we always want to make sure we start out meeting specification. And you just need a simple uh, one quart container. Uh, so we're going to measure by the linear foot. And one of the things we did in our one of our last uh, edits, revisions to the Special provision is we decided to go with a both a full width application, the 18 inches wide, and then the half width application. So we do have two new pay items in the system for the full width and half width. To me, I think the, the big advantage of this is when the, the contractors and they send the project to their supplier or subcontractor who will apply that, that having that half width in there uh, really jump should jump out to the uh, appl application subcontractor that they're they're going to need to do a little extra mope. We're not coming in just apply it full width down the center line, but we're, we're doing some also some milling and filling on the project and you're going to be applying it half width. So maybe it's a little uh, boot and suspenders kind of philosophy, but I think it's a great way to to pay for the product and uh, be, be clear about how it's getting put down and where we're putting it down. I'd like to thank all the uh, NRA members, although this wasn't an NRA specific project, but our research pays off related to uh, all the contractors, DOT, other agencies that are that are helping us uh, with these projects. So I want to say thank you, and that's it from a standpoint of the Iowa DOT research and our new MinDOT special provision. So thank you. Thanks so much to both of you. Uh, I am going to allow, un allow Mike for attendees. 
Um, so if you, I know we have a couple questions in the chat, a couple of questions and comments, um, but if you have additional questions that you'd like to just ask verbally, uh, you should be able to do that now as well. And let's see here. So I think the first question we have uh, is from Jason. Can the minimum density at the joints be reduced with the application of VRAM, or what is the recommended joint density required to where the VRAM will perform well? I think I can take that if that's okay with you, Jerry. Sure, go ahead. Uh, or I'll start. Um, the density testing or coring is typically waived within a foot of the joint, and that's just because of the extra asphalt content that's there, so you're not able to use the production GMM, or you would have to calculate a, a new GMM based on, you know, the asphalt content that's in place there. Um, <clears throat> that would be a lot more extra work to do that, and in addition to that, that joint area is going to be compacted the same way, you know, the rest of the mat is compacted anyway, so that's been waived in, I think, all of the state agencies that have adopted a VRAM specification. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question I see from Stacy is, did any of the case studies shown have a rumble strip ground into them? And I know Eddie had uh, mentioned that MINDOT sections had rumbles, but maybe one of you wants to yeah, so, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure on 22 we would have ground in the rumbles there. So is is the question just do we have locations where the rumble is ground over the VRAM product? And I think the answer to that is yes. Great. And, then, and the early, oh. if I could state too, the early IDOT work did not have rumbles ground into those projects. I think okay. Eddie's gone out the, on the prod, the two locations where we've put it down. Uh, I know he was out there last year. I think he's been back this summer. And, and I will say that from a performance standpoint, you don't see a big difference in the first couple of years and you really shouldn't that even our control sections where we don't have a, a VRAM product ought to be in pretty good shape after two years. But it, as you could see from all the photos Todd showed that, it, that it's after, you know, 10 years and maybe sooner in some places where you have longitudinal joint problems, uh, that you're really going to see the difference in performance. All right, next question uh, is from Randy. How many suppliers and subcontractors are there for VRAM products? Next one to two other suppliers besides our company that I'm aware of. There, and it, was it on the production of the material? Could you say that again, Lauren? How many suppliers and subcontractors are there for VRAM products? So it, I yeah. would think, yeah. Subcontractors, I, I don't know, at least half a dozen. Um, I, I don't have an exact number, but uh, there's there's a fair number and that list is growing. And then Todd, uh, can IDOT and MINDOT material labs run the tests listed in the MINDOT spec? We're not gonna run every test listed in the spec. Uh, talked to our chief chemist, I think there's three of them that we're going to run. And, and that's somewhat similar to uh, with our joint sealant materials. We have three different joint sealants that have different uh, an ASTM modified type specifications and we don't run every single test uh, to kind of verify uh, what we believe that they're meeting specification. So I, I believe we're going to run three of them. Okay, I just saw a couple. Uh, looks like Jim says Illinois does run the tests specified. Um, 
And then I have another question from Tyler. Has there been any issues with bleed through of VRAM? MDOT ran into that issue years ago. Yeah, I, if I could pick up on that. So early in the work, um, we we were recommending rates and we saw rates being used that were um, developed around coarse graded mixes. And I think when we first started seeing flushing, those same rates were being used in fine graded mixes. So so yeah, that, that's that been observed. And um, since then, those rates have been adjusted downwards for the fine graded mixes. And so those rates are about two thirds the rate of a, what a coarse graded mix would be. So um, when that has been seen, and it's not been very often, um, it it hasn't created any long-term issues that I'm aware of. Okay, great. Uh, and just a reminder, I did uh, change the settings so that um, anyone can unmute themselves as they'd rather ask the question verbally. Um, otherwise, we can keep going through the chat here. Uh, I do have another question from Stephen. Has this been tried with any overbanding material to address voids at the top 25%? Uh, hmm. So uh, topical seal um, in addition to the VRAM on the bottom. Um, I think that's the question and, and I'll answer at least how, how I'm aware is that Indiana DOT does apply a fog seal at the joint in addition to doing the VRAM underneath. That's going to be an emulsion, not a not a hot applied product. Uh, and they would spray that. Uh, I want to say at two feet, two foot width, but I'm not entirely sure if that answers the question. Maybe Stephen can chime in again here. Uh, meanwhile, I do have another question. How does IDOT, uh, this is from Dan, uh, how does IDOT prevent bridging of the roller when the adjacent lift is placed, such as when the pavement is not placed high enough? Does it even matter when using VRAM? And Stephen says, yes, thanks. That answered his question. Not sure how to address the, the question on the bridging, I think it was. Um, yeah, I can't picture what the question's asking. Mm -hmm. Could that person unmute? Question from, was from Dan Kopatz. Um, well, let's move on to the next question. Then I do I do have another one here. Uh, it's from Ashley. Is there a preference for VRAM to be placed directly on a prepared surface or on cured tack? Why? So this, I think the question is tack before, tack after. Is that how you hear that, Jerry? Yes. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen it both ways myself, and I don't know that I would have a preference other than we've seen more of a tendency to, to pre-tack a milled surface first to let it fully cure, and it does have to be fully cured, but um, to, to pre-tack a milled surface first before applying the VRAM, just because that milled surface can, uh, as you all know, be very difficult to clean and you want a clean surface before this is applied. So the thought behind the placing the tack first is to help glue together some of the fines that still may be left on that milled surface and, and get a better adhesion of the VRAM material. All right, I've got another question here from Randy. Has VRAM, and Ashley says thanks, that that answered her question. So Randy yeah. says, uh, has VRAM been tried with an asphalt overlay on a concrete pavement? One or two that I'm aware of, and the one that 
does come to mind is in Missouri on uh, it's the interstate near the Lambert International Airport in the St. Louis area. I think it's 170. Um, and in early work, you know, and I talked about some of the the uh, application method of applying with the uh, strike off. Um, it was applied on that project in that way, and it, it's still performing well. And I, and I saw that Jim Trepanier was raising a hand, so I, I think he's wanting to add to that. Oh, sure. Jim, if you're still with us, you want to? Yeah, I thought I saw that little hand symbol raised. For yeah, me. I don't see it anymore, so maybe he decided not to okay. um, comment, but uh, let's see. Dan says, um, hey, Jerry, you want to stop sharing your screen? OK. There we go. Uh, so Dan says he's not able to unmute for some reason. Sorry about that. Um, I am referring to compaction at the joint. We have had issues with the adjacent lane not being placed high enough, which leads to bridging of the roller at the joint. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that's that previous question. I, um, Sure, the VRAM would help there, but at, but at the same time, you know, you I think that it's not the best practice to be a tenth of an inch higher there. So um, I, I would say where that would really factor in would be even on a mechanical solution. If you if you were trying some of the other methods that are out there, if you had the bridging at the joint and um, weren't getting the density that you needed there at the joint, you're, you're going to have even worse problems than you otherwise would have had with a VRAM type of material. All right, uh, and then I have another question here from Greg. This is a material solution to the longitudinal joint issue. Is there need or recommendation to change paving, paving or rolling process along with using VRAM? I'm not quite sure. So uh, MnDOT's done a lot over the last few years to improve longitudinal joint. We've tightened our longitudinal joint specification. Uh, we're doing more coring there. We've raised the density. So we've we've done we've addressed some of the I'm gonna say the you know the lower lack of density there through uh, paving operations and then so the VRAM is, is another solution to improve the joint or, or the, a way to get about the best longitudinal joint out there with the procedures we're using today. The one thing I, I would add to about the um, changing or not the rolling pattern would be that recommendation that we would make would be not to use pneumatic tired roller directly over where the VRAM would be and we I don't think we've run into a contractor that's really doing that anyway so it's it's in general not been an issue I know I know airport pavements often use pneumatic rollers but um, until that material cools there at the joint area with that high of an asphalt content, it tends to be a little more tender, so you can still do your regular rolling process with the steel drum roller, but pneumatic tired rollers um, might be better to leave those off of that area. But I wouldn't see any change in the paving. Other than maybe lifting, having the lift gate raised at the end of the screed just to make sure it's not dragging through the material. All right, and Jim just added the comment that on interstates, Illinois requires an application of LJS directly on the concrete and another application over the binder lift prior to the surface placement. Uh, any other questions?
Any other comments from you, uh, Todd or Jerry? No. Okay. No. Uh, well, I just wanted to, uh, for those who might have missed at the beginning of uh, my announcement about the September workshop and NCATS meetings, um, we have made the decision to not host those uh, either in person or virtually in September. Uh, the NCAT meeting is going to be postponed to a date to be determined, and you'll find uh, more information available in an email to be sent out later this afternoon. Um, but know that uh, that is no longer happening. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us uh, for the great discussion uh, and Thank you to our presenters for their time and their information. And we hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, a few more minutes added to your schedule today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thanks, yes. everyone. Thank you.